good evening. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you all tonight to the public forum, the first of two events comprising the fall 2013 Religion in the Public Sphere Conference on Religion, Sexual Diversity, and South Asian Youth Culture in the GTA. My name is Amanda Goodman, and I'm a member of the faculty of the Department for the Study of Religion here at the University of Toronto. And on behalf of myself and my colleague and co-organizer, Karen Ruffel, along with all of the affiliated RPS faculty and staff, I'd like to thank you for coming out tonight. I would also like to take the opportunity here at the start of the evening's program to thank our generous sponsors, including the Religious Diversity Youth Leadership Project, the Religion and Diversity Project, the Mark Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies, the Center for South Asian Civilizations, the Department for Historical Studies, and the Department for the Study of Religion for their kind support of these events. Before I introduce tonight's uh, panelists and outline the format of tonight's forum, I'd first like to say a few words about the Religion in the Public Sphere, or as we call it, the RPS initiative itself. RPS was founded in 2007 to build networks of scholars, students, and community partners concerned with how religion is at play in a range of public contexts. Working with specific themes such as religion, education, and civic identities, who is a global citizen, and art and public contestation of religion, RPS has organized uh, dissertation and multi-university research workshops, an undergraduate service learning course, public forums like the one here tonight, as well as several community research workshops like the one scheduled for tomorrow at UTN. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of tonight's program. Uh, those workshops are all designed to bring together scholars, students, policy experts, and professionals to discuss research, policy, and practitioner perspectives. In 2012, working with the Center for Community Partnership and then Multi-Faith Center, RPS won a three-year grant from Citizen and Immigration Canada for the Religious Diversity Youth Leadership Project, which combines research innovation, interaction with policy professionals, community engagement, and student training and mentoring to provide opportunities for young adults in the GTA to discuss issues related to religious diversity in a way that allows them to develop as both scholars and community leaders. The present conference theme, Religion, Sexual Diversity, and South Asian Youth Cultures in the GTA, is intended to create an opportunity for U of T students, faculty, along with community partners, to engage in a discussion about religious, ethnic, linguistic, sexual, and gender identity, <laughs> oh my, um, both here and now. And by here, I mean Toronto, downtown, the Peel region, the GTA. And now meaning uh, several generations into what is an incredibly diverse community that for a long time now has been um, expanding, developing, and challenging uh, Canadian values of assimilation and multiculturalism. So we are pleased to have with us tonight five distinguished speakers from across the GTA um, to help us discuss these matters. Um, and you might just want to give a little wave out um, so that everyone in the audience can follow along the discussion. Um, Kavita Bisundio is a mixed media artist, facilitator, storyteller, and a self-identified recovering student organizer. She has participated in a diversity of social justice projects and continues to engage in community building and peer support by and for queer and trans people of color and indigenous communities. Kavita currently serves as the service coordinator at the LGBT Youth Line and as a facilitator for the Peer Youth Violence Prevention Program, Respect in Action or REACT. El Farouk Kaki is a refugee and immigration lawyer and his practice involves representing women fleeing gender violence and LGBTQI people fleeing persecution because of their sexual orientation and or gender identity, as well as their HIV status. A nationally recognized human rights and social justice advocate, El Farouk has been the recipient of numerous awards and distinctions, including, and I just picked this one at random, uh, the 2007 Hero Award given by the Canadian Bar Association Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Conference. In 2008, he ran for Canadian federal parliament in two elections for the New Democratic Party of Canada. And in 2009, he co-founded the El Tawhid Juma Circle, or the Unity Mosque, as I know it. He is co-founder of the Canadian Muslim Union, past chair of Africans in Partnership Against AIDS, and sits on the advisory board of Muslims for Progressive Values. Farah Khan holds a Master's of Social Work from the University of Toronto and supports women who are survivors of violence as a counselor and advocate at the Barbara Schlipper, is it Schlipper? Schleifer. Schleifer Commemorative Clinic 
at the clinic, Farah coordinates Outburst Young uh, Muslim Women's Project and is also an artist who uses prose, video, and craft to explore the intersections of migration, faith, and community. She edits Heartbeats, the Izat Project, a graphic novella by South Asian young women about resiliency in the face of family violence. As a nationally recognized educator on violence against women and as an emerging leader in grassroots equity movements, Farah has received numerous awards, including the Toronto Vital People Award. Momen Rahman is associate professor, if I got that right, of sociology at Trent University, who teaches and researches in the areas of sexuality and citizenship and celebrity culture. He is the author of numerous publications, including his 2000 monograph, Sexuality and Democracy, Identities and Strategies in Lesbian and Gay Politics, his 2010 textbook, Gender and Sexuality, Sociological Pro Approaches, along with numerous articles on LGBT issues, including work on que queer representations in sports celebrity. He's currently, his current work examines the tensions between Muslim cultures and sexual diversity, and he has just completed a manuscript on uh, homosexualities, Muslim cultures, and modernity due for public, uh, publication later this year. Uh, Ramraj Shavendram uh, is a graduate of York University and has been working with queer, I think I just botched his name, but that's okay, uh, has been working with queer identified communities in the GTA for the past six years. In 2011, Ram became the Tamil Outreach and MSM Prevention Coordinator at the Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention, or ASAP, uh, where he provides frontline services for South Asian and Tamil speaking MSM, manages online resources, and co facilitates several support groups. Ram is also a host and producer of a weekly radio segment on CHRY 105.5 FM in Toronto um, that discusses issues of health and human rights as they relate to queer identified communities. In addition to these five panelists, I'd also like to introduce tonight's forum moderator, which fortunately is not me, but Aisha Valiani, who's currently a master's candidate in the Department for the Study of Religion here at U of, TA, of, U of T. Before graduate school, Aisha served as a residence don for two years at New College, where she counseled and mentored undergraduate students from diverse ethnic and academic backgrounds on a variety of issues, including those around sexuality and gender. Aisha's current research focuses on religious diversity and minority rights generally, and specifically on how religious freedoms and rights are negotiated in Canada through constitutional law. My thanks to all six of you for agreeing to take the center stage tonight and for agreeing to field some tough but important questions. So we'll begin tonight's discussion with a series of quick questions and answers directed at the panelists to give them a chance to sort of unpack <coughs> or demonstrate where they stand on some of the so-called critical terms, that is, uh, the constructed and hence contested terms on the table here tonight, South Asia, sexuality, and so on. And that will be followed by a more nuanced roundtable discussion scheduled to run until approximately 6.30. I'll then return to the podium to open the discussion up even further by taking questions from the audience until about 7, when we'll convene and head upstairs to the art lounge for a reception. And at that reception, we will have a short performance by the Outburst uh, Young Muslim Women's Group that I mentioned in conjunction with Farah's work. So um, I'm now going to get out of the way so the real conversation can get underway. So Aisha, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Is this? Yes. So again, thank you so much to everyone for being here. Um, this is an exciting and engaging and potentially very empowering subject. Um, and I know that everyone has lots to say on it because you all do such exciting but very different work around um, the issue. That being said, as Amanda mentioned, we're, I'm going to ask you three very quick questions uh, just to kind of get things going. Um, so in a minute or less, and you can pass if you'd like, um, if each of you could let me know, what's your South Asia? Anyone can start. <laughs> I, should I start? I'll start. Okay. Um, I don't live in the GTA, I live in a village north of Peterborough. I moved here from Britain, you know, six years ago. So there is no South Asia there. That's like me, and there's another guy and I'm sure you can guess what job he does, right? <laughs> like, you know, there's one of two options, I guess. Um, so for me, it's weird, because I used to live in big cities in Britain, you know, full of Asian people and Muslim people. So at the moment, my South Asia is speaking to my mom on the phone <laughs> and her complaining about my brothers and sisters, quite rightly, in my view, um, <laughs> and me supporting her. Um, and it's family, like, that's what it always reminds me of. Great. Who's next? <laughs> I'll take this in what order. Um, <laughs> Okay, so 
I have a minute, right? Okay, so uh, South Asia, when I see South Asia, it's, it's a broad term, it's supposed to be unifying, it's supposed to you know, build solidarity, connect whatever it is that connects us all who've you know, migrated or have ancestry from India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, all those areas down there. There's a whole list, I'm not gonna list them off because I'll miss one. Um, but you know, there is that part. But then there's also that part with people who actually identify with that term or can relate to that term and say, oh, you're South Asian, I get what that means. They automatically assume, okay, India, um, Hindu, Hindi, elephants, um, curry, right? That's, that's what they get, right? You don't really get anything further than that. And so me being, you know, Sri Lankan, Tamil, um, you know, that doesn't really fall into that mix, right? So it, 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 it's a catch-22. So there's, a, like, there's that benefit of, you know, getting solidarity from a community that you can relate to of a lot of aspects, a lot of cultural pieces can connect. But then there's also that part that, you know, you sometimes get shafted, you sometimes don't get represented, and you lose that diversity of voices when you see a community as homogenous when it's not. Wait, please. <laughs> um, well, when I saw this question, I was really confused about whether or not I was just supposed to like say why I'm qualified to speak about South Asia or like where I'm from. And then I was like, that should not be what this question is. Uh, and then I was like, okay, uh, what is South Asia in my life? Uh, and I guess South Asia in my life comes to me in the form of my family and my friends. Um, and uh, a lot of my friends who identify as South Asian are actually mixed race. Um, so a lot of my, especially because to tell you where I'm from, <laughs> and my family is from Trinidad, so we're Indo-Caribbean. Um, and I feel like Indo-Caribbean people are sort of what some of the people that Ram was talking about who often get left out when we conceptualize South Asia as only belonging to the subcontinent. Uh, we often forget diasporic peoples who've been forcibly removed for so many reasons. Um, and that's definitely relatable for me and my family and my background. Um, so yeah, but and within Trinidad, South Asians are super mixed up with everything and everyone. So uh, for me, my friends and family are super diverse, I guess. So I'm, I'm a double diasporic as well because I'm from Tanzania, I'm from East Africa. So my South Asian identity has been something that has actually developed later in life because I never really saw myself as being South Asian. And my access points into my South Asian identity have been, first of all, based on, on how people choose to identify me because I'm, I'm just not black enough to be African. Uh, so people have, have often imputed a South Asian identity to me, but my own segue into, into uh, embracing that as, as, as my identity or part of my identity, I would say are Sharwani, Kawali, and Mitai. So the, the clothes, the spirituality, and uh, the sweets. So... Um, I saw that. Um, so when I think of South Asia, I grew up, uh, my family's Indian. Well, my, my dad is Indian, my mom's Dutch. And so it was a constant um, challenge for me as a young person and as an adult where people would always, within my family and outside, be like, well, you're not really South Asian or you're not really Indian. Um, and I'm, yeah, and I'm light skinned, so that I definitely carry a lot of privilege around that piece. And so what does that mean? And it's a constant negotiation and also the space I take up um, and thinking about that. Also, my grandmother is from Trinidad, and so it was, is definitely constantly also hearing the racism within my family, within ourselves, even talking about, talking about she's my step-grandmother, but she's my grandmother. Um, and growing up with her since I was a child, and then hearing what that meant for her to be considered South Asian. And so it's definitely something that is a constant question in my own life. Um, so, I, yeah. But I think it's, for me, like honestly, it's the hand gesture sometimes. It's the way that we talk to each other in my family. Mm -hmm. It's the way that the smell, like the smell in the apartment building where I grew up smells like South Asia to me. Like the smell of certain foods smell like my family. And the hand gestures especially remind me of my grandmother and my auntie. So there's certain things that just are family. Yeah, no, oh my, that was great, thank you. <laughs> Apparently a minute can fit a lot of very nuanced <laughs> thoughts. Um, so to go on to another very large term in a minute or less, what role does religion play in how each of you understand your South Asian identity? And again, you may pass or take the question however you wish. Ask. Yeah, sure, yeah. anyone is start. comfortable starting. Um, so the Kawalis and the Zikrs, like the, the, the Sufi practices, have been a very important medium for me to access 
South Asia. Um, it's been through coming to uh, embracing my spirituality through Islamic Sufism that I have learned about the Sufism in in, in, South, in, in South Asia and its impact on, on larger society and it's through the Qawalis and I mean everybody knows Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan but that's only the tip of the proverbial iceberg, right? And so it's been, it's been through that medium that I've come to actually appreciate and embrace. Um, so my religious dimension is actually very important in terms of discovering my, my South Asian heritage. So. That's it. Thank you. That was the question, right? That, that was all yeah. of the question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can, oh, Anyone sorry. else willing to okay, follow okay. that up? Um, so I grew up in a very, um, so I grew up in Toronto, North York, in a very white neighborhood. So I was the only brown kid other than my siblings growing up. You know, trying to find that South Asian community wasn't really there until later on in life for me. Mm -hmm. And so growing up when I, you know, would get up in the morning, shower, brush my teeth, you know, pray, um, that was all very like clockwork, it was all very ritualistic. And you know, when you would get together with family, other than birthdays, um, for weddings, funerals, um, mm -hmm. you know, when your sister had her period and there was that Samadhi Buddha and all these kind of things that would go on, all these ceremonies and traditions and celebrations were all tied to religion. I didn't see it as this big institution as anything. It was just a part of the culture, it was a part of building that community. It was a part of, um, you know, that time you get to like, be around your family, work together, collaborate on something, uh, celebrate something, and it was all that and, and more. And so my South Asian identity, really, because when I went to school, it had to stop because, you know, when I'd bring curry to lunch, it'd get made fun of, so I'd pull that back. Or if I tried to, like, you know, uh, people try to figure out what language you speak, it's automatically, you speak Indian. Like, you know, like, okay, <laughs> great. So <laughs> automatically. Everyone who's South Asian speaks Indian. Yeah, like, you know, I w when the, we it's had a new like, kid. Also, it's a language, yeah. We had a new Don't kid. <laughs> no, no, I speak Indian. No. 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 I speak Indian. <laughs> we had a new kid in the school, and like I barely spoke Tamil as a kid. Like growing up, it was hard. And like there was a kid, and he speak, spoke Gujarati, and they expected me to translate. Right. <laughs> They're like, "Oh, come down to the office, at a school of 900, and you're going to speak Gujarati to this kid because you know you're Tamil, and that's the same thing." Well, you're, you're kind of the same skin color, so obviously. Right. Yes. Um, yes. And so, so yeah, religion was tied directly to the to the essence of whatever culture I had growing up that was South Asian, that was Tamil, that was Sri Lankan. It was it was tied to religion. It was tied to these traditional ceremonies. It was tied to me getting up in the morning. Um, putting through it on my forehead and then walking to school and then you know having to wipe that off because mm -hmm. I was nervous, right? There was there was all those layers to it. Mm -hmm. So religion was tied to it, um, which is why it's it's kind of still a part of my life. It is a part of my life still because it was it's so rooted to, mm -hmm. you know, the culture. Sorry. Did I go over? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want to go ahead, Kavita? Sure. Um, I guess religion for me is uh, good and bad in terms mm -hmm. of formulating my South Asian identity because. Uh, a large part of my family is Catholic, and my mom grew up Catholic, uh, and Catholicism is a big force of colonialism in the Caribbean. Um, so through Catholicism, you know, people weren't allowed to speak uh, their languages, and so a lot of my family has lost the ability to speak Hindi. That's not something that my parents do, that's not something that I do, um, and that's pretty painful and really shitty. <laughs> um, but in terms of my dad's side of the family uh, being Hindu, like, that's something that he was really born and raised in, um, even though it's practiced really differently uh, and has been altered also through colonialism and through travel and loss of um, yeah, historical memory. Um, the way that my parents practice Hinduism is really different and I'm often reminded of that when I go into South Asian spaces. Uh, the way that I do things is wrong uh, and the way that I do things uh, is, is weird um, and the way that our temples are built are different and uh, yeah, so I'm, co I'm constantly reminded of my otherness, even within South Asian community. Um, yeah, mm. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, how, so wait, the question about South Asian and yeah, my identity. How, uh, what role religion plays in how you understand yourself as being South Asian? I thought everybody, when I was a kid, I thought everybody that was Indian, well, first of all, I thought all South Asians were Indian, and I thought that all South Asian people were Muslim, um, because that's what I was exposed to. In the area where my father lived, um, he lives in Malvern, and um, well, he lives not in Malvern anymore, but he lived in Malvern, and the whole community was, at the time, was a lot of Indian um, Muslim, and so, you know, we'd go to parties, and everybody would look like my family, and everybody would act like my family, we'd all, you know, sit on the floor and eat, and that was our, that was our jam, and um, so for me, it was always interlocking and connecting. I didn't know that there was people that were Hindu or Sikh until 
I got older because I went to an all-white school. So you're already the only Muslim kid and South Asian kid in the school. And then you kind of have to start building these ideas and these narratives because there's nothing to challenge those narratives. Or the only narrative you see is during the Gulf War was when I started seeing South Asians and Muslims starting to be talked about, but in a very derogative, terrorist way. So that's when I started actually seeing that. So I think for me, um, it was very inter integral with my understanding of what it meant to be South Asian was to be Muslim. Mm, thank you. Is it me? Last um, one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was sent this question a few days ago and I was thinking about it. Because um, I'm not religious and I wouldn't identify myself as a practicing Muslim. And I haven't yet outed myself as to where I'm from or wherever. So I'm from Britain and my family are Bangladeshi. Um, I was born and raised in Britain. They emigrated there from what well, actually was, I guess, East Pakistan back in the day um, when they emigrated. Um, I didn't see anything positive about um, Muslim religion w when I was, um, not so much when I was growing up because it was a normal part of our culture, but when I decided um, that I was gay and I wanted to come out, like it, it was absolutely, you know, something that I couldn't have anything to do with. I literally left home and moved. Uh, and I was in Britain, I moved almost as far as I could from the south coast to Scotland. Um, and for many years, that's really what I felt about the religion. It wasn't part of me. It was, I was Asian. I was South Asian, but, you know, I didn't want to be a Muslim. Um, and then much more recently, you know, because of things that we're all aware of, um, I've identified as a Muslim, you know, I identify as a Muslim as a kind of, you know, ethnic category because of the increase in Islamophobia, and I, that really does piss me off, and it's, that's driven a lot of my academic work um, more recently. Um, and one of the things I've had to recognize is that people who, it, within my family who have also returned to the religion have returned to it for positive reasons. So it's actually had to make me think about what is it that people are getting um, from a religion and from spirituality in a period where their identities as either Asian or Muslim or terrorist or whatever are, are so constantly under scrutiny. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so it, I've come, come back to religion in a very weird way. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm still mm -hmm. outside of it, but I'm looking at it now and thinking, okay, well, you know what, this actually is a, it's a positive force in certainly in some of my family members' lives, including, in fact, mostly the women, mm -hmm. which has been a real shock to me. You know, a, a kind of um, secular academic, um, you know, super fag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but that's the yeah, truth, and that's, and that's yeah. been a real education to me, and it's interesting, <laughs> interesting for them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. A lot of very interesting points raised there about <coughs> culture and identity and stereotypes, and hopefully we can actually continue the conversation after the last and final one-minute uh, bang question. Um, so kind of keeping with what you said, Farah, and what you said a moment about stereotypes and how <laughs> and Islamophobia and how certain attitudes are formed based on what's accessible and available via the media, sexual diversity, another category, I think, that is that is faces certain stereotypes. Um, so what does that phrase mean to you or to your community or to the work that you do? The word sexual diversity yes. or the how phrase, do you what does it how mean? How do you kind of come to understand it? <laughs> In a minute or less. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually different when you sent it out. <laughs> yes. It, I think it was different. Yes. Yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, great. You're free to speak about the term in any capacity. Can I post that again? Can you read that out? Yes. Yeah. So sexual diversity. Uh, what does that phrase mean to you or for you? Nothing. How, nothing? <laughs> no, that, that's, that's OK. Nothing. I think it's such a Western, mm -hmm. sometimes it's such a Western piece that like, gets imposed too, right? Like when I, I don't, that's, I'm just going to say for myself and speak. You can challenge me about it. But when it's sometimes, even the idea of that push around coming out, the push around um, conversations around sexuality gets so influenced by what is seen as Western ideas of what sexuality is. So that spectrum is already, the labels and the tools that we're using to even have these conversations sometimes are based on things that don't even exist in my, in my understanding of it. And like, I have to be like, oh, I'm this or I'm mm -hmm. that. Um, for me, like, how religion is a part of that or how my community is a part of that is this conversation has been happening in our communities for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's not that sex and desire and the way that we love each other and the way we show communion with one another is just something that luckily the West came and told us about it. Mm -hmm. And now we know, right, as South Asians, 
we come from communities that have a long history. And I remember I went to India with my dad, um, and I'll stop after this. I went to India with my dad a couple years ago, and it was the first time I went with him. And we both had this moment where I think you've been told for so long that there's something wrong with your community, and then you see how beautiful your mm -hmm. community can be, and how special and diverse, and how people are having these conversations. And you know, there's messed up stuff too. Like I'm not saying it's perfect, um, but it was a moment to be like, oh yeah, like we are this amazing community and somebody else has been speaking on our behalf for a long time. Um, but in terms of sexual diversity, yeah, but even that term for me seems questionable. Mm -hmm. And I think you guys can add on to that. So I mean, for me, the, the term sexual diversity, I mean, great when you're talking clinically about, about spectrum of practices and, and so on and so forth, but what I might consider to be sexually diverse may, may not be somebody else's definition and you know I mean you see that at pride when when I see people walking around you know with choices that they have made which wouldn't necessarily be mine um, but that's fine uh, but it doesn't it's not a it's not a term that I own or that I possess it describes a particular social context um, or the fact that people have different practices or different manifestations um, of their sexuality, but that sexuality can be their sexual orientation, or it can be a matter of, of something that's that's a, that's a personal choice in terms of lifestyle or, or or sexual practice. So it's 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 a rather for me it's rather vague. The original question was, how has your own mm -hmm. sexual identity been shaped within the context of that <coughs> South Asian identity? Mm -hmm. So for me, because I haven't really had a South Asian identity, and I'm sort of starting to connect to it. Um, for me, I tend to think of traditional communities or traditional values because what will your auntie say or you can't tell yeah. anybody, it doesn't matter whether you're South Asian or you're, you're Somali or you're, you're Caribbean or you're whatever. Um, those are sort of overriding sort of cultural, cultural norms that, that many traditional uh, families or communities have to, have to deal with. So um, my own sexual identity, I guess, you know, when I, when I, the second time I came out to my mom, um, <laughs> they didn't believe me the first time. <laughs> uh, so I went back in the closet. And the, the, the second time she said, I'm not going to tell anybody, right? Um, and don't tell your father because she's going to have a heart attack. And then she went home and she told him. Yeah. And he didn't have a heart attack, right? Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think in the context of the shame and, and you know, Lali accuses me of, of, of being the, 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 the shaming uncle or the shaming auntie sometimes or, or, or whatever. But that, 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 that social shaming stuff that a lot of our cultures seem to have um, is not necessarily South Asian. And, and that had a, I was always very mindful of, of trying to protect my dad in the Muslim community because of his profile as to how he would be impacted by, by me being gay. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that it, has imp that it impacted him. I know that it cost him in certain ways in, in, in the community. And at, at some point, I had to let go of that burden and that guilt that, that I actually, I think, still to some degree carry. But I really didn't have a choice about a lot of things that I have done and a lot of spaces that I have ended up in. My, uh, my mom discovered recently that back in 1993, I got a death threat from Islamic Jihad. But I had to keep those kinds of things from my parents. And it wasn't because I was South Asian, because I was Muslim. Right? Mm -hmm. so. Does anyone else? That was more than a minute. I'm That's sorry. okay. That's okay. <laughs> I think going back to what Farah was saying about diversity, I feel like I'm really averse to it as a term because of my associations with it in relation to whiteness. Like we are considered to be diverse because white people are normal. Like the same way with like sexual diversity, it's like LGBTQ2SIAA people are considered to be like we are diverse and we are beautiful and we exist in all this multiplicity of ways. But uh, I think the way the term is often used is in relation to heteroness as the norm, and I don't think that that's right. And as far as I was saying, like we have existed in all the ways we've existed for forever. Like white people didn't come and make us the way we are. Like they destroyed us <laughs> and actually invented things like the closet. Like people were gay before the closet existed. So that's, I don't know, it's really frustrating. Um, but also I think that like diversity with it, sexual diversity as a term or like in reference to like even this panel, I feel like uh, we're all really different. We come from a lot of different backgrounds, but there's still like no presence of trans people here, and like that's really problematic because trans people are a huge part of my community, and within South Asian communities, trans people have always existed. So, 
I don't know if that's one aspect that I've been thinking about this whole time, but I don't know if that's problematic. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else or nope? Sexual diversity is really ridiculous. Really <laughs> <laughs> sexual diversity. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to just say something yeah. which kind of slightly disagrees in one way with everything that everyone else has said. <laughs> um, and it's just, and it's partly this is because I, you know, I teach classes on gender and sexuality. Um, and one of the things that always strikes me is that, you know, and most of the students are, you know, early 20s, um, is that there is, you know, we, we, we need some term, we need some umbrella term, we need some way of organizing and being visible politically. And I accept that a term like sexual diversity doesn't necessarily encompass anything. But I think that's exactly because it is always related to the norm. But the norm exists. The norm is socially dominant, it's legally dominant, it's politically dominant, <coughs> and not just in white culture, but in Asian cultures mm -hmm. too. And the norm is a gendered norm. It's a norm about what can women do, what can men do. Um, you know, I, I talk a little bit in my book about you know, imagining a, um, recovering some traditions in various Asian cultures and Muslim cultures where masculinity is different. You know, what it isn't this, this kind of macho, particularly to me in my eyes, kind of a North American masculinity, you know, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with sexuality. Um, but those norms are there. And I think that um, I, I agree that we shouldn't have to be defined by those norms. But in, a, in an everyday basis, I think we are. And lots of people um, who are not us do, do define us by those norms. And I think we have to be able to critique and interrogate those norms. We have to be able to say, no, this is heteronormative. This is, you know, there is gender equality in this co community or this culture or, you know, that. We have to have some way of doing that because otherwise, um, you know, we may end up saying, well, you know, diversity doesn't, isn't really a, an appropriate term for us, but that diversity can then just disappear, right? Because mm -hmm. we're never interrogating our culture. And, you know, our, some of our cultures are patriarchal, and I don't think we should run away from that but idea. I, I think the problem is when you say, oh, I, you, you're sexually diverse. <laughs> you know nothing about my sexuality. No, no, right? I, I agree. You know, it, yeah, yeah. As, as a label, or as a personal label to take yeah. on. It's a nice clinical term. It's a nice yeah. academic term. It maybe even is a, is a good social term, but, but it's not it's a good personal term, as well, right? right? Like, I think you need yeah. to have a political mm -hmm. Sure, but it's, not a, but it's not a personal term. I don't think of yeah. myself as being sexually sure. diverse. I think of myself <laughs> as being gay. Yeah. I think of myself as being queer, yeah. right? That's my identity. It's not, oh, I'm sexually diverse. Yeah. Um, I just, so. And I just want to say too, it's there's and nobody ever says they're sexually yeah. diverse. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. that would be crazy. Adventurous, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> and the one thing I think gets lost sometimes in this conversation, especially when I when I work with South Asian young people, and I think there's something to be said too about the fact that when we have those categories, we lose um, the connections between the communities. So when I work with young people who are in relationships that are in relationship with someone that is, they consider themselves heterosexual or they're in a relationship right now with someone um, and they are not telling their families, they have the same conversations with a young person who is queer that's having a relationship that their families might not know about as well. And sometimes we lose those conversations mm. when we just go, okay, mm. you can talk here and we're gonna have a group here. And like, mm. what I've seen is actually conversations that happen that the multi-layered of, well, my family doesn't know that I'm having this relationship mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you negotiate it? Well, I negotiate it this way. I negotiate mm. it this mm -hmm. way. I have two Facebooks. I have two cell phones. Yeah. I got yeah. lots of different things. Yeah. And so sometimes yeah. what I think that happens is that we need to build solidarity and also allyship. And when that allyship happens, yes, there is differences and there's privileges. Like, in the end, I'm like, you can get married and your family may be at your wedding. I'd love my dad to be to officiate my wedding. That ain't going to happen right now, maybe in a couple years. Mm -hmm. But if I get married, but like, <laughs> I'll officiate you. I want my dad to. But <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Do it, so. But um, so and, I th and that's one thing. And the other piece that I think is important to notice too is that yes, you're right. There is a difference too. Is that you know I saw I was just in a conference last week with Muslim dom on the Muslim domestic violence, and so they then they had this special section, the LGBTQ section. And they said, at last minute, said, okay, Far, can you just facilitate the conversation? So this is like 50 people from across the United States who are doing work on domestic violence. I'm the only LGBTQ person there, and can you facilitate that conversation? And of course, the linkage for some people was around pedophilia. 
and then the linkage was a lot of different pieces, and I had to, I was quickly doing this with LGBTQ 101, homophobia, heterosexism 101, but very frustrated that mm -hmm. it gets lost out in the conversation or it's seen as a side conversation instead of a central conversation that sexuality in of itself we should be if we're talking about sexual violence and gender we have to centralize it instead of making it an offshoot mm -hmm. conversation and that's something that i'd like to see more instead of it being something on the side as a queer south asian woman and a muslim woman i'm tired of, of that being on the side so we talk about diversity and only lgbtq is included in that that loses out real conversations about how we have not just sex, but how we love each other. I'm kind of tired of just talking about the way we have sex. I like to talk about how we love each other more. Thank you. No, I'm really glad that this this was troubled, the notion of like having a concept of sexual diversity, because I think I can take the liberty to speak on behalf of everyone who was involved in organizing this conference in whatever capacity that religion, and those people who study religion will know that you can never define it. Sexual diversity, South Asia, youth culture, and GTA are about two million very contentious personal, political, and diverse terms. And I think sometimes we fall into this rabbit hole of essentializing people and making categories very definitive, and that's problematic. And I'd actually like to not ask the question that I was gonna ask first, and go into the question that I was going to ask third, because a lot of you brought up um, the trouble that young people, and I think indeed a lot of adults face, which is trying to negotiate these multiple diverse dynamic and important aspects of their identities. And when I was um, a residence don for two years, I had 90 undergrads who I mentored and counseled, but also I think most importantly lived with. So I saw everything in 10 months, I saw them in the initial stages of questioning, in the stages where they tried to articulate their questions and in the stages where they actually would come to me to ask questions and seek out resources and whatnot. Um, so even though there was discomfort with what these young adults, youth, whatever you want to call it, were experiencing, the one thing that they could always articulate was that they wanted to remain committed to their familial expectations. They felt like they had a sense of responsibility to their parents, their siblings, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins, and their entire communities, whatever that might have meant to them. So I'm wondering if you all could speak to perhaps your own experiences or ex your experiences counseling and working with young adults, because I think all of you have engaged with young people um, at some point through your work, <laughs> however that might have been. Um, and tell us a little bit about what you thought were the best strategies for helping people to go through this very tough, multi-layered, intersecting time in their lives. It's hard to balance religion and lots of questions, I think. Can I start? Of course. Cool, okay. Um, so the first thing I would, or I do, or to mention is to alleviate a lot of pressure is to just get over the, the hang-ups, get over all the rules you've been told about, you know, that you need to define where you're going and you need to get there now. Um, and, you know, because there is this box that, like, so if you're assumed straight, there's this box that you're going to be a lesbian, you're going to be gay, or, you know, possibly you have the option of being bi and you got to fit into one of these. Or, you know, guy, girl, trans man, trans woman, like, you got to fit into one of these boxes. Um, gender and sexuality are fluid, um, and you don't have to jump into a box, and you don't have to jump, period. Um, and I think that's the biggest push, because, I mean, in the media, everyone's like, okay, you should come out already, everything's gonna be okay. Your friends are like, okay, come out, and things are gonna be awesome. You know, why haven't you come out yet? My friend did it. Um, you need to be there, you need to get there. No, that's not a thing. Um, it might be for a few, lucky few, um, but like if you're going to rush into something, don't let that be it. There's a lot of things you can rush. I'm a procrastinator, I get it, but <laughs> that's not a thing. Um, and so just get over that hang up that you need, to, you need to find this destination and you need to get there fast because there is no rush, you don't need to. Um, but at the same time, um, you also just need to, you need to be okay with where you're at. You need to find out where you're at and if you don't know where you're at now, give yourself time. And so that's one of the major things that people are automatically in this rush. They're like, okay, I think I like guys. Um, what do I do? Um, you know, should I be gay now? Should I come out? Do I have to go to these places? Do I have to go to these gay bars now? Do I have to do this? And no, there's no expectation and there sh you shouldn't be putting these expectations on yourself. I'm, I know they're all around you and you can't help but internalize them because they're there. Um, and especially when they're the only examples that you're seeing, right? Um, and that's, that's a problem. Well, keeping all that in mind, so not to rush into anything, not to force yourself to define yourself into a box, 
um, expose yourself to, to resources, to people, to conversations. Really, um, the conversations are, at least on a personal note, like, you know, being a queer youth who was Tamil, like those conversations um, of even talking to somebody, you know, who maybe didn't share the same background as me, but, you know, had, um, that wasn't heterosexual. Having conversations um, about sexuality that wasn't what, you know, guy and a girl ends up together happy ending, um, that changed everything. That opened like a huge door. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in a university where I had access to a space, but there's like, there's youth line, you can call it, right? And there's like so many spaces around the city that you can find, um, that you can talk to people, you can meet people in chat rooms to talk about things. I mean, you know, tread carefully with chat rooms sometimes, but like, um, there's so many different, yeah, you can yeah. chat with them, youthline.ca. Um, you can come to ASAP, I mean, yeah. if, you're, if you're a dude, because we have, we have support programs for MSM. Unfortunately, we don't have stuff for queer women just yet, um, but hopefully that's something that's in the future. But like, there are spaces out there you can talk to people, you can read literature about people. You know, ASAP has a library, Beyond the Line, Between the Lines, you should check it out. There's like books, that authors that write stuff, you know? Like, there's so many resources out there, just take your time to explore those resources, explore those identities, find those linkages, because you're not gonna find them right away. Like, I'm not gonna watch Will and Grace and be like, yes, that's me. <laughs> you know, that's my connection, and be happy <laughs> with that, because a lot of the time we settle, we settle, we concede for the, these identities that were presented, and we jump into them, we're like, yeah. okay, this feels right, it just feels, this is my escape from like feeling like I'm trapped, and you know, I'm gonna go with this because this is what makes sense to me. But it doesn't have to be the be all end all. I mean, the fact that you can't find a South Asian character on TV who's queer right now isn't mm. isn't your <laughs> fault. Isn't a problem with you. Isn't a problem. Yeah. Oh, is there oh, is there one? True. Oh, okay. And she's I don't a want great to show. Character. The good wife. Yes. It's so oh, hard. okay. So great. it exists. She's <laughs> great. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, have, yeah. I have no idea, but. Like, there are examples out there. I mean, you can be your own example. I know that sounds cheesy and tacky, but like, it, it's just like going into those spaces and being okay that, you know, you're not the same as everyone else, that's cool. It's really daunting, especially like, I mean, coming out into spaces on campus that were predominantly white, or like, you know, having to find spaces with even South Asian folks, and then, you know, being the only Tamil guy, and you'll be like, oh, I don't speak Hindi, right? Like, what is that? And then, you know, you find, uh, yeah, I don't speak Indian, right? Um, but finding spaces that, then there are, you look a little further, then there are other queer Tamil folks out there, right? You just gotta find them. You gotta, they're out there, they're not as accessible as, you know, the faces you're gonna see on TV or the faces that are leading the organizations on campus sometimes, but they are there. So, uh, in, in short, like Reader's Digest, um, don't jump into anything, <laughs> don't feel like you need to be boxed into something, um, and don't feel like you need to be like everybody else on, on TV or the mainstream, and then expose yourself to stuff to find out where you need to be. Cool, done. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone can go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. That was really good. Okay, cool, cool. Just checking. And, and don't feel bad to talk about the actual work that you do. Don't feel bad to actually speak about the youth line or um, ASAP or whatever it is okay, because cool. myself and another one of the graduate students um, will later use all of this information and use the things that have come out of this conversation to actually write a report that we would like to make accessible to all kinds of people, and that's one of the intentions of RPS. So we love learning about resources, especially the good ones. Cool. Sorry, so go ahead. Um, so last year I wrote this letter on National Coming Out Day because uh, I was just infuriated by so many people on my Facebook just being like, coming out day, I'm out, blah, 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 I have to come out. And I was like, that's not how it works, and that's not my life, and that's not my reality. I'm not out to everyone in my life. I can't be out to everyone in my life, um, as much as I wish that I could be. Uh, that's not acceptable for me, uh, because I don't want to risk things that we're talking about, access to my culture, access to my family, access to my cousins, uh, access to my temple that I never go to, but <laughs> would really want to if they did queer things, um, but they're not going to. Um, but maybe they will one day. But um, I wrote this <laughs> I wrote this letter on National Coming Out Day that was to queer and trans people of color and indigenous folks, and particularly youth, about um, just my love for them and how you don't have to come out to be gay. You don't have to come out to be trans. You can live your life the way that you need to live your life and that you know what you need to survive. Nobody else can dictate those things for you. And you know, if you come out now, if you come out never, you're still who you are, you're still gonna be gay. And nobody can tell you that you're more or less gay than somebody who's out, right? Because those are things that we often hear as people of color from white mainstream media, exactly what you're talking about 
means that this is, this is the way to live and this is the way to be and your life is going to be so much happier. But that's not everyone's reality and that's not how it works. Um, so another part that I was talking about in this letter was basically that you know, you can lead multiple lives and you're not lying. All of those lives are real and they are true and they are authentic. If you're gay with your friends, that's cool. If you're not out with your parents, that's still real. You can be out at school, you can be not out at school, you can be out to your brother but not your sister. Like, the way that you navigate that is yours and that's real and that's how you survive. And, like, you should be applauded for that and you're really brave and, uh, that's, you know, youth know what they need to do. I can't tell youth what to do. <laughs> when you call me at Youth Line, I'm not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> but we're going to talk about <laughs> what you think you should do and what you think uh, are your options and how you can navigate those things. Um, but yeah, that's all I want to say. So I think that's true, but I think as you get older, your options tend to dissipate, especially in our cultures where heteronormative marriage is, is, is such an issue. Mm -hmm. And so my mother in the 1960s eloped to marry my father. And 30 years later in Canada, she called me up to arrange a marriage for me. I was like, because <gasps> they don't come from a community that's had arranged marriages in at least two generations. And certainly she eloped, like, hello, what are you doing, mm -hmm. right? So this was when I had to come out the second time, and I got a book for her called um, Now That You Know, and it's written for, for parents of, of queer kids, now that they know. And my mother, who speaks English as her first language, East African, she used to be a teacher, educated woman, blah, 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 says, this is for white people, this is for Christians, we're not white, we're not Christian. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. And so this is, you know, this is, a, this is for me, this is kind of, <gasps> again, it's another one of these, you know, t take back that my mother, who's fairly westernized, this, that, educated, blah, 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 really open, that that's, that's her response. So I, I think one of the things with, uh, with Islam, as with Christianity and Judaism, but particularly Islam and I think Judaism, is that we're textual religions. So a large part of the homophobia is based on on doctrine. It's based on what people say the text says. Um, so while it's fine to uh, advise people um, about not boxing themselves, a lot of the people that I encounter, so a lot of the people I encounter as um, are not necessarily South Asian, but they're, they're, young, they're young queer Muslims, um, is that they have somehow um, shamed their families and disappointed their parents. So I have a Ugandan lesbian sitting in my office who's crying because when her father discovered that she was lesbian, he arranged a marriage for her with a man who was about his own age, who came from a tribe that practices genital cutting, female genital mutilation. My client was lucky enough to be able to escape. But she feels that she is actually a bad Muslim because the Islam that she has been taught was that she had to obey her parents and not shame them. Right? So I'm sitting in, and she's sitting in my office and we're having this conversation. So then I have to resort back to text. So I tell her the story of Abraham and how God in the Quran speaks to Abraham and says, don't follow your father's ways. Yes, you should love him and yes, you should respect him, but you should not follow him because what he's doing is wrong. So then I asked her, I, we, you know, we walked through her sexuality, we walked through the, the whole female genital mutilation thing and I said, so, I think it's your dad that's wrong. And yes, you should love him and you should have the, give him the respect that he deserves, but he's not right here, you are, right? But that's how I have to shift the, 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 the narrative and the, and the conversation, is actually going back into a theology. Um, so that's my refugee clients who often have no family or they've been abandoned mm -hmm. by their families, they've had to run or flee, and so they are in isolation and struggling to find community and to find space. The other through the mosque that I get are some of these folks, but also uh, young Canadian queer Muslim kids who um, have access to the internet, have access to Church Wellesley, have access to the youth line and so on and so forth. They have all of that, but they don't know how to, because, to deal with their families because the narrative still is that homosexuality is a, not a Muslim thing, it's a white thing, it's not, 
or it's a Western thing, but it's not it's not our thing. Um, and so to come up with 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 a with a discourse discourse around that and the narrative, and I think that's still you know I I've been struggling as to how we. Um, how the mosque and how larger than the mosque, because not everyone's going to come to the mosque, mm -hmm. and, and, and even if they do, we don't have that capacity. But how we work in, in, larger, in the larger community uh, to, to integrate minority, racialized minority, and religious minorities into the framework of, of some of these organizations. And I'm thinking even organizations like PFLAG and, and so on and so forth as to what resources they, that they have that can be tapped into. I don't think there's any perfect solutions. I think this is going to be a, a, a long process. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to build on this conversation. So um, I'm going to give you an example. So I'm a therapist. And so, and I'm, but people also know my identity. So sometimes I get that call from a teacher being like, we got, we got one. And I'll be like, what do you got? And they'll be like, we got a gay Muslim kid. We don't know what to do. Send him to Florida. Yeah. yeah. As if I have a magic wand. But so, so I got a call once about this young person. Um, they may or they may not. They, they were struggling and, and having some questions in class around, their gender and also their sexuality. So they didn't, they didn't know. They were like, maybe I'm trans, maybe I'm queer. I, I don't know, but I just have some questions. The school was like, well, in this school, you got to come out. So let's bring your family in. Her, her family did not, English was not the first language. No translator. Bring the family in. Come out to your family. What did the family do? They're like, you're going back home right now. Mm -hmm. Because, and not because the family was violent, not because the family was aggressive, but they were just like, what is happening in this school? And so when I hear this piece around, you know, when we're working with people that are vulnerable, and I think young people are vulnerable, and because of the fact that economically, when a young person is, leaves home and they're 18 years old, we have a housing crisis in Toronto. When, I, when a young person leaves home, I have a hard time finding them housing. We have shelters that are made majority for young white youth that are maybe queer, maybe street involved, different things, but don't understand what the needs are of diverse. Well, I'll use that word diverse. <laughs> um, but in the you know youth, we also have an issue where we have a job crisis where we can't get jobs for these young people. So then you're setting up a person. So we need to rethink about how we have conversations with people and respect the fact that yes, some people are like. I want to be out and I want to do my thing, but other people may not, and not pressure people to put themselves in a position of further vulnerability. And so that's something that I think about as someone who works with young people who are experiencing violence. Um, so that's something that I raise as a flag. The other piece too that I think about is um, now with the media conversations, we, our stories don't even, they start before we even get to that story. So there's a narrative that continues about South Asian communities around honor. Right? Around this idea that um, honor of our families carries within our body. And I can say that when I was growing up, that was definitely a conversation mm -hmm. that, you know, the things that I do affect the collective, right? So when I do something, mm -hmm. it affects like my cousin's right to get married or someone else, right? But it also um, limits the conversation because the, com the family rules of how to be and conduct myself is different than the family rules that happen in Kavita's family or your family or our family. It's like, we don't have these monolithic ways of being and homogenized ways of being. And so oftentimes when I work with young people as an adult ally, because that's where I am now, um, I often say, OK, what are the codes of conduct in your family? And what are ways that we're, we can challenge those codes of conduct? Is there everything in your family follows those codes of conduct? What happens when somebody breaks that code? What happens when we challenge that idea of what it means to be a part of our family? So that's something that I usually use is have conversations about it. Instead of saying, like, this is the way South Asian families are. This is the way all of us are, because they're very different. And so that's one of the pieces that I do. Um, I would, last thing I would want to say is when we were working on this comic book that we did with young South Asian women, one of the things they said, and they brought this up, was um, things to tell myself when people tell me I'm wrong. And one of the things they said was, I need to tell myself that I'm a good daughter, good cousin, good granddaughter, good niece, good community member, good person, good religious community member. 
for speaking out, for being just me, for loving myself. And I think we have to remind ourselves that. Mm. I get a lot of young people who say to me um, that they stop loving themselves when they don't fit into what they deem is normal. And I think self-love is a really big part of doing community-based healing. Self-care, yes, mm. but self-love is what I'm more mm. interested in. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't really work you know, with young people in, in that kind of supportive way, because you know, I'm prof, so I'm not actually being, I'm just depressing them. Um, <laughs> and it's fun. Um, oh uh, but, uh, you know, so I'm not, like, I, you know, I respect the work that everyone else does. And I, it really struck me that, um, that, you know, it's a good time, right? Like here, because there are resources. I was thinking, I'm 45, and I was thinking to when I came out in my early 20s, um, to my family, I mean, it was such a mistake, and I didn't. But I didn't have any of these kinds of resources, right? People saying to me, "No, don't do it," because actually, it will be a disaster. Um, <laughs> but there are no Asian, you know, queer groups or Muslim queer groups or anything like that in Bristol at that time. Um, and uh, but I absolutely agree with this thing that, that there is this kind of assumption in the public realm that somehow gay rights in Canada are kind of so normalized that coming out is going to be nothing. And that is not true. And it's not true for white people either. You know, it's just, it, but the, lots of people say this to me. And um, I think it's there in the media. And I think we really, you know, if we can resist that as well, we can say, well, actually, this isn't true, not just for our, you know, our people from, you know, our kind of background, but it's not true for everybody. You know, I know plenty of people, um, you know, who are not South Asian who, who don't, haven't come out because it would be awful. So I think there's this kind of, the, I, I don't know what it is, it's like this idea that somehow gay rights, queer rights are completely normalized. And I think that that's really not true. We know that's not true from violence and all the rest of it. Um, but the other thing I think that Al Farouk said was that there needs to be some kind of community resource as well for parents or for families mm -hmm. that, that isn't about the individual. Um, and I, that's why I think this is maybe an exciting time because you know there now are helplines and groups and conversations like this and um, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, I agree for strongly is that we actually need to have, um, whether they're Muslim groups or they're Hindu groups or South Asian groups more broadly speaking, there needs to be a discussion about, you know, well, what do we, you know, it, is all that we can think about sexual diversity or queer people, however you want to phrase it, that it's really a Western thing? Mm -hmm. Because we have historical traditions in all of those cultures of, tra you know, what we might, they didn't call them trans, but we might call them trans, or you know, um, accepting um, homoerotic behavior as long as certain family kind of you know or gender fulfillments are required. You know, I'm not saying that those are perfect, but that invisibilization of a huge range of diversity has has happened in Asian cultures, and I don't really, and that's political. A lot of the time, it's political. And we do need to have some way from the ground up from these community organizations some challenge of that so that parents and families have a resource to say, well, wait a minute here. No, that doesn't have to be how you interpret the Quran or that doesn't have to be how we treat people within our community. Because one of the things I wish I'd said at the beginning now, mm -hmm. actually when I think about South Asian, I think about Bengalis or Muslims, there's a lot of harshness there, but there's also always been a lot of compassion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's because traditionally those communities are poor or have been poor in the West, but there's always been surprising compassion around lots of things like gender violence or queerness. Like my family have actually been quite compassionate towards me, even though they'd rather I didn't tell them. They don't mind that I'm gay, they just don't want to know about it. Um, so yeah, more resources for the community. So I feel like, sorry, go ahead. I just feel, yeah, like the way that this question is kind of set up, it's, it's intended to talk about the coming out process, right? right. That's the way that that question mm -hmm. was, but that's not the only issue mm -hmm. that affects South Asian queer and trans youth, right? Mm -hmm. So exactly what Farah's talking about, we get calls all the time about youth who are struggling to find housing, who are experiencing discrimination in shelters, who can't find jobs, who are experiencing discrimination at school uh, from teachers, from who are being bullied in mm -hmm. class, right? Those are, those are issues that affect South Asian queer and trans youth, right? It's not just about coming mm -hmm. out, and I think the idea of coming out is still grounded in this like very white homo-nationalist <laughs> Idea. Right, so and, and because we're diasporic, sometimes our families are scattered over two or three continents. Mm. So the, the comfort that we might have of having the aunt that lives down the street 
is not really a reality for a lot of us. Our aunt may actually be living three continents away or, you know, 5,000 miles away. Or, 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 but you still or have so. a responsibility to do the honorable thing. To you do, but you also don't right. have the resource to that person right. in, the, in, the, in right. the same way. Like the understanding uncle or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the gay uncle who's moved away, who mm -hmm. could actually mm -hmm. be your, is, is, is not always sort of right there. Like my family is spread over three, mm -hmm. my small family is spread over three continents. I don't actually have the support within the family. I mean, I have it now, but you know, it wasn't always sort of, was, wasn't sort of always there. It wasn't always accessible because we were diasporic, we were mm -hmm. scattered. So there wasn't even mm -hmm. people that you could, e that I could easily resource, mm -hmm. you know, to turn to for help, so. And for me, like, I think as, I almost talk about Muslim first sometimes because I feel like that gets attacked more. Like, my name's Farah Khan. When I go across the border, nobody asks me who I'm sleeping with. They're mm. like, oh, your name's Farah Khan? Oh, come, you just come over the side, right? Special security screening yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah, it's always random. random. I, I'm always random. Random, 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 random screening. Yeah. So for me, like, I think it's really important what Kavita brought up is that the fact is, is that sometimes it's not the, the main piece and it becomes, for some people it is a central, a central piece, but sometimes there's lots of other things that we're dealing with and we need, we need services and programming that really looks at a holistic person um, and also recognizes that, like, that families do, that there's not one way that families react to this and I don't want to create this one way that all South Asian parents are these horrible people. My dad, my dad would send me letters, my dad excommunicated me for a while and then would send me these emails that were actually really beautiful. And um, he used to say things like, it's devastatingly heartbreaking to be separated by, separated by someone you love. And like, I was like, oh my God, like my dad would tell me these like love letters, because my dad loves me. But he's like, shoot, like how do I love my daughter when I've been told for so long that this is wrong? Mm. Mm -hmm. And so we need to also create spaces, especially, you know, as I think South Asian men, get really vilified in the media and are created as these terrorists or violent people, that when, when a youth is coming out process or process of just self-love, let's forget, like just self-love, like loving whoever they are and whatever they are at that moment, um, oftentimes when we get back and we hear from counselors or services, they're like, oh, well, they're from the South Asian or Muslim or Sikh or Hindu community, oh, we ought to be more worried because their families may try to kill them and all these like narratives. We need to actually challenge that mm -hmm. and create spaces to be like, maybe our families may not. Maybe they will be violent. Maybe they will do really messed up things. And that's a reality for some of us. But there's also a reality where our parents need a mourning and grieving period. So I love the idea of more supports for families. Right. And like on that note, just for as we head towards our last question, um, all of you work, you all do incredibly important work. You know, you're activists, you're, you work with youth, you work in certain communities, you work within your religious communities, but I think in, in many ways you're all educators and you all engage in a very real way with the people that you work with. But something that each of you have mentioned, Farah, you mentioned about the school, um, you know, the hotlines, there's, there's certain expectations and perhaps that might be, just to throw in another big word, because why not? We are, we, you all work within secular institutions. So just to speak to what you, again, mentioned, Farah, and maybe each of you could reflect on this quickly, even though it's a huge question. Um, what do you think would be the best strategies for engaging with, not necessarily even the person that you're counseling, but families and community members and allies to educate and to support, whether that's within an educational institution or within the framework of your hotline or within a, you know, the legal setting. Like, how, do you, how would you ideally, this is very positive, but ideally see education work being done with families and community members so that they can be more supportive, but also learn, right? Because there's a huge learning curve for everyone when you're addressing these issues. <laughs> I think that's a really hard question. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> Can you repeat that? Mm -hmm. so well, really, like just that. what ideally would you like to see happen looking forward, um, whether <coughs> it's within policy or it's within ac the creation of actual resources within an education institution, within legal institutions, within community services that would support not just individuals who are questioning or developing their identities, but also their families in a way that understands religious diversity and. Um, different religious lived experiences. I can start with that if 
Oh, yeah, please. Sure, while well, we come up with that. <laughs> uh, well, I just finished this book, and at the end of it, I talk about um, the final chapter is actually called Beginnings, because I'm talking about, you know, how are we going to start to remove homophobia from, you know, um, as a kind of defensive part of Muslim cultures, and how are we going to recognize the fact that queer cultures, queer politics, quite often mainstream queer politics, actually participates in Islamophobia, um, you know, so how do we kind of challenge those things? But one of the things I think is, is very important is that, that our, you know, and I'm, I'm saying this very broadly because I don't belong to all, this, all of these communities, but our communities need to produce that um, perspective and experience themselves, right? So we need to have more visibility for particular groups, maybe even you know, there needs to be, um, you know, more uh, forums like this where there's research published or summaries published. And um, I think it's when you have these, and particularly kind of different types of information coming out, but from information that isn't perceived to be kind of imposed on us by, you know, other groups, right? So I'd, it, it's great when, you know, pride or queer organizations have um, support groups or, um, try to acknowledge an issue about, say, racial diversity or whatever. Um, but the, we, we can't seem to imagine the other side of that, which is, you know, why aren't mainstream South Asian groups moving towards that? And I think that that's where we really need to be to, to not o only own this, but to do it effectively. And that's a huge, huge issue. But you did say ideally. Mm, ideally. Um, so, with a big grant. But I don't think that that happens unless, um, you know, young people um, get involved in it. Um, you develop appropriate resources, whether they're educational materials or they're just knowledge, or it's stories, or... Um, and, you know, there is, there is still this thing that we can... We can understand reactions um, from within our own community better than outsiders can. Right, like so, um, you know, I would be able to, I'd be able to relate more to sort of Bangladeshi, you know, Muslims and probably British <laughs> Bangladeshi Muslims, than say, you know, um, Tamil people who are immigrants here or people from um, Sri Lanka. <coughs> um, but those communities themselves, however they're defined, if I think those resources and visibilizing those resources, so that we're not um, dependent upon. Um, you know, kind of add-ons or, 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 you know, like the, you're just this kind of sideline um, thing. Uh, like, you know, one of the things, this is a very boring academic thing, but I'm involved in a queer caucus in an international studies organization. Um, and it's tiny, and, it, you know, like it's mostly white, but we're all queer. And there are people doing work on things like, you know, the Russian law, mm. um, uh, the, the oppression, the use of kind of gay politics to compress people in Uganda or whatever. Um, but within that organization, it's so important that we're there because the majority of them are just these, the people who were writing papers about why didn't we, why did democracy fail in Iraq? Why did our imposition of democracy here? Like, you know, it's just this really dominant mindset, right? So even that little bit of kind of activism um, helps to kind of make people think, okay, well, wait a minute here. We, not necessarily all queer people want John Baird going around um, you know, blaming, using queer rights to, st to, to um, stigmatize Iran. Come out, John, come you out. Know? It's, um, <laughs> so I guess yeah, all I'm saying is that we, you know, I think it, it, it needs to be our communities providing those resources rather than relying mm. at the moment on the notion that, you know, we can be add-ons to other types of, say, queer groups, particularly because I think that does then send us back to this, it's, it's really a Western thing. It's not, and those of us that, who are out and queer or who, who want to be queer have somehow betrayed or left our cultures. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that has always upsets me about mm -hmm. the fact that I came out, which, you know, was kind of a huge mistake, but, um, <laughs> and, you know, that it's, <coughs> it's <laughs> I, you know, I don't want the next generation to be, to think that they have to leave their cult, you know, that they <laughs> are going to be invisibilized from their cultures. Um, there's too much other shit going on for that to happen, right? <laughs> Racism is getting worse. Poverty um, for non-whites in rich countries is getting worse. Um, poverty around the globe is getting worse. You know, there are all these things going on, and um, 
you know, who cares who people s sleep with, right? <laughs> I know it, I'm not dismissive. It's a big deal, but, but I think but our own resources. But you see, yeah. that's interesting because yeah. we're getting to like the Republican right that says, yeah. "Who cares who you're sleeping with? We just hate the Muslims." Right. Um, right. And I, I, agree, I have to agree with Fire. There has to be a, a little bit of accountability and mainstreaming. Um, you, you touched on that as as, yeah. as well. Um, I mean, I think organizations like ASAP, Alliance for South Asian AIDS Prevention, and so on do help sort of shift the narrative, but they work within very, you know, within very specific population bases. Um, APA does Africans in Partnership Against AIDS. Again, it sort of shifts the narrative. It brings uh, heteros and straights and queers and all sorts of people together that can, they can hopefully sit at the same table, break bread together and start to break down some of their prejudices. But this needs to happen in the more mainstream organizations. So a few years ago, and when I was organizing my annual IFTAR, I asked the Canadian Arab Federation to put it up on their on their um, regular e-list, and they didn't. And I know all of these people. I know them by their first name, right? <laughs> uh, they didn't. And a week yeah. went by, and so on and so forth. So I emailed and I said, "Aren't you publicly funded? Why are mm. you refusing to put this up? Right? You're getting money from the government. You're, uh, you know, you you've got you've got uh, human rights requirements. Why aren't you putting this up?" So what they did is that they put it up, but they left the queer part. <laughs> Right? So then I'm getting phone calls from people who want to register for it because I have to go through a screening process, especially in, 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 in those days. And I'm like, you do realize this is, uh, you know, where chances are we're going to have a woman leading prayer and it's a queer affirming, LGBTI affirming um, space. Well, that was a backlash for, for Canadian Arab Federation from that because people were pissed off, but they were being disingenuous. They didn't put the queer right up there and deal with it. They, wanted, they didn't want to deal with it, and then they wanted to sneak it in on the side, hoping that nobody was going to notice. Right? You can't do that. Right? What we really need to be working with is, I think, working with the, with the larger institutions, and that includes the religious institutions. Um, the, you know, I always quote... Um, um, Thumper's mom from Bambi, right? If, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything. Uh, that. Huh? That was Thousand that was Daddy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that reference. Yeah, she was making fun of the other person. Yeah. Nice. yeah. So, so if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. Right? So we need to at least begin with that. Uh, but I think what we really need is an integration in our larger communities. And some of it is, is related to funding. I mean, I think, you know, you, you use all the tools that you have. You tell the stories, right? When it was about what Bill 167, if any, if people are old enough to remember back in the 1990s when we were, you know, struggling for equal spousal benefits in Ontario. It's about telling your stories. When people learned that people were, were that you know, dads were being excluded or children were being excluded from visiting their, you know, visiting their dads in hospital who were about to die of AIDS because the birth family didn't approve of the relationship and, didn't re and the law didn't recognize that this was a family, right? Uh, when people who had been together for 40 years and when their partner died were, not enti were left penniless uh, um, and were not entitled to any benefits or any kind of security, when people started to hear those kinds of stories, that's what, it, what started to shift popular opinion. These are the kinds of stories we need to be telling within our communities. This is what we need to be documenting so that South Asian community services or, or Caribbean um, community health services or African or whatever it is um, start to hear these stories coming from within their communities um, and, and shifting the narrative that way. I'd also like to see queer communities be Absolutely. less racist. That's the other part. And, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, like I've been to, uh, I went to a dance party two years ago, and uh, my friend who wears hijab, that wears hijab came with me. And first off, she walked in, and somebody said, it is so nice of you as an ally to come here. <laughs> so assumed, assumed a lot, assumed a lot. And then the next thing that happened is that a woman came up to the three of us, there's two other, and we are not visibly Muslim women, but she, she was, or she still is. Um, and they, this woman said, you are haram, said that to her, and you need to go, and started pulling off her hijab. And we had to get the bouncer, and the bouncer wouldn't do anything, because they're like, oh, this is just like, you guys are just joking around. And I'm like, no, this is actually physically violating us, and we're feeling uncomfortable. And it kind of became a sideshow for people um, in the space, and it was, I still, like, um, viscerally, it just, it was so upsetting. And so I want more spaces that recognize that there's lots of different ways to be in space. And it doesn't mean that you have to talk about those spaces or talk, like, be like, this is my queer card when I walk in, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and the other piece, you know, is we've seen things, and I think people have written about that around um, drag queens, you know, dressing up in the gob, mm. you know, and I'm going to blow myself up mm. and different pieces around that. So we know that there is conversations that still need to be had. And when I do trainings with LGBTQ organizations, they're always like, okay, well, how do we deal with the homophobia in the Muslim world? And I'm like, well, how do you deal with your Islamophobia? And I want to know if I'm going to send a youth there that you're going to be working on your Islamophobia and your anti-Hindu and, and understand what Sikh youth need and what, understand what Caribbean youth, youth need because you can't just expect me to just check our community around our homophobia and transphobia and not check yourselves around your racism. So I think for me, it's like it's a very much a give and take conversation that needs to be happening and continue to happen because I don't think we're still at the place where we're still we're seen as sidelined. We're seen as like we bring the diversity to the LGBTQ community sometimes and ask to speak in that you know that special one person and that can't be the way either. You want to go first? Sure. Okay. Um, I guess I think when we're talking about working within secular institutions, I don't think that that's a thing. Like, I don't think education is really secular. I think that, like, education and law and all these other institutions are really informed by Christianity and by, like, white hetero patriarchy, right? So, like, when we're thinking about how we work within those systems, it's similarly to what Farah was saying about, like, give and take. Like, where are we? Like, it, I feel like sometimes we talk about those institutions as if we're outside of them, as if like we don't belong to them or they're not ours for taking or ours for changing, but they are and like we have a stake in them and there are a lot of people who are working within institutions to dismantle them or disrupt them or change them from the inside and change like change their transphobia, change their uh, homophobia. Um, and I think like, I don't know, like when you're talking about ways that we can change that and it's like a give and take and changing our racism, I guess I think about Youth Line where I feel like I'm really, really lucky and like really, really blessed to be a part of a small staff, staff team, which is hard at times, but like to have a really amazing boss who is like also South Asian and she's Tamil and she's really fierce and to also be working alongside other Caribbean people, uh, like our other coworker is uh, Afro-Caribbean and the three of us, you know, we tackle racism and transphobia and homophobia as much as we can every day and try to make that space safer for uh, indigenous youth and queers of color. Um, yeah, so I guess like seeing us and ourselves represented in the spaces that we want to change is a part of that. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that's all. Thank you, cool. Rob. Want to take it away for the last yeah, few minutes? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. Could you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. <laughs> right? Because like, it, <laughs> there was a lot of things mentioned, so I kind of lost my focus. Yeah, it's yeah. understandable. Yeah. Um, essentially, just make it up. I, yeah, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. Um, no, ideally, how you'd like, or what you'd ideally like to see happen to continue to educate people who might be questioning or exploring certain aspects of their identities, but also their allies and their families and community members, the best kind of educational model or resource. So what can change with the system yes. right now? Okay, cool, cool. So I'll throw a bunch of things out there. Um, one, and I'm <coughs> probably gonna like plagiarize everything that everyone said, so just you know, deal with it. Um, so narratives is one of the things. Um, you, uh, somebody mentioned narratives, and I think that's a really, I think Al-Faruq, you mentioned it. Um, it's a really important factor, but I think we have to always also be aware that um, not just showing like the worst case scenario, it's showing a lot of strength, right? Mm -hmm. but I think we're all talking about a lot of issues that are going on, and we're also talking about you know, how we can help youth, but we also need to acknowledge the fact that you know, there's a lot of youth in the audience, or people that have you know, surpassed youth, um, you know, the, and uh, surpassed you. At 35, at 35 now, 30, so some so people are still in there, but yeah. like you, you survived, right? <laughs> you survived, you got to this point, and I think we don't acknowledge that fact a lot of the time, that a lot of people did get through, because it's, it's not a nice place outside. We did get through a lot of things, you know, layers of racism, layers of sexuality, layers of gender that, you know, affected us and the way people perceived that, and there is a lot of strength out there, and people telling those stories about their strengths and how they got through stuff and how they dealt with stuff is really important, and I think we, we often look at what the problems are and how do we address these problems we don't look at the people who have actually got through those problems and how they got there and you know what they did and celebrate them for that because you know they got there and then we just kind of forget about them we kind of forget that happened so that's one thing narratives are like essential um, the other thing is funding so when you're looking at funding and this is one of the problems we run into at ASAP right so we can get funding because you know gay men or men have sex with men are represented in the epi data for HIV and you know they're one of the populations mm -hmm. that are disproportionately affected 
However, we can't get stuff for women who have sex with women, so WSW populations. Why? Because they're on the data yet. So we're waiting for it to be a problem before we can find solutions for them. So why? We can't identify the fact that you know, there's stuff going down, um, but we have to wait for research. And who's putting that research out? Who's going to be looking at that research? Whose um, interests are, um, are on the table when we're saying, OK, let's start a research problem. Let's write a grant. Well, if this grant isn't look, if I need to write three grants this week or this month, which one am I going to prioritize? The ones that I know are going to get funding because they already do and not the other ones. So we need to shift that focus as to, like, we can isolate problems, but we don't need to necessarily back it up with when the problem happens, then we'll try to find solutions. It's too reactionary. We need to, there needs to be more of a proactive approach. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, like the Acme commercial. Definitely. Okay. Can I put, jump in two things? Yes. Okay. So one thing one is, left. yeah, yeah. Okay. One cool beans. Cool left. beans. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then one thing is the this assumption that our communities are innately like ignorant and homophobic and all that yeah. stuff, right? So we get to this point where we like we it's automatically at the point when a South Asian youth comes out or any person of color comes out, they automatically have to jump into white spaces because yeah. those are the spaces that are available, and we are programmed and assumed that oh my God, our communities are regressive. They're not going to be welcoming to what we have to do, what we have to say. So we have to go to the other spaces. They're the ones available. There, uh, there is support there. I'm not saying that there isn't, but there's also a hell of a lot of other issues going on there mm -hmm. that are not being acknowledged. So we have to check our South Asian identities. We have to check our religion at the door and access those spaces and sacrifice that. And I think we need to have a little more faith in our communities. Yes, there's a lot of crap going on in our communities. South Asian communities, Tamil communities, Hindu communities, Muslim communities, all that jazz. There's a lot of crap there, but there's a lot of crap going on everywhere. And I think we ignore that fact and we focus on the crap. And so we're like, we, hate, we need to leave. We need to flee because there's all this crap. But there's a lot of crap in a lot of communities. I said crap a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm rushing. Um, just but our communities can be exclusive. <laughs> yeah, I really did. Our communities can be inclusive if we give it a chance. And we need to build that internally. We need to build that inside. And we need to stop looking outside for solutions and giving like other groups and saying, hey, you know what? We have a problem here. You can get funding out of that. And this is going to happen. Or you can go here. And and then this is going to happen. You're supporting a larger issue that really doesn't support your interests. So look within the community, because a lot of community organizations, a lot of community members doing stuff like with little to no money, mm -hmm. or some with funding, and some you can organize. You can figure that out. So that's a space for that. Sorry if it, you know, <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Um, yeah. And just just to wrap it up, I suppose, because the time has gone by, but it was a great conversation. Um, it's evident, and I think this can be said, one of the few things that can be said universally, but there's a lot of work to be done with all of these um, in all of these areas. But that being said, again, each of you are a testament to the fact that work is being done. So just quite literally, in a minute or less, um, I'm hoping that you can each speak to an experience or an encounter that you've had uh, that just shows that work is being done and that people do feel supported. Um, so I think, so I went to this workshop about science fiction, and they were talking about, you know, our ancestors didn't really believe that people like us could exist, and we're, we were science fiction to our ancestors. And I think youth are science fiction to me, because a lot of the queer youth I work with, I'm just, they blow me away. And so one of the young women, I met her when she was 16, and at the time, her school was like super worried about her, and they were very much focusing on her sexuality, and she had a lot of other things going on in her life. And I started doing work with her and working with her community. Um, and she actually is, She's an, she's an amazing, prolific writer, poet, everything. Um, and she actually was featured in the grid this year and talking about how much she loved herself. And it wasn't, and she was like, you know, for a long time I thought, God, Allah didn't love me. And I realized that I can love myself, my community can love me, and there's nothing wrong with me. And it was like, I like get emotional every time I think about it because I'm just like, wow, this young person is maybe 20 years old and and she's doing this, speaking out in a way that I wish I could speak out publicly in a way sometimes. And she inspires me all the time when I see her and other people that she works with and the community that she has built. And that, to me, is, is a sign of things shifting because there's more spaces for people to claim space. And she's claiming space. She's just like, this is all my space, and I'm going to be me. And that's what's really, I think, continues to inspire me and continue to do the work I have is that she's also benefiting from some of the work that's been done by our ancestors and our community. And that's what I think sometimes I think is important, the intergenerational conversations that we learn from each other of how much we build and also how much we can learn from other people. It's evident that there's potential. It just needs to be nurtured and worked with. My turn. Yes, okay. one minute or less. One minute. <laughs> one minute. Like our minutes. Right, right. 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 So. One minute. Um, <laughs> I guess like the story I just told about my workplace is a is a story of success. I am a South Asian queer GTA Hindu youth 
and I'm working in this environment that's really nurturing and supportive with other uh, like women of color. And I guess like for me, um, a lot of my work is it's not simply about like South Asian people, but it's about racial justice for everyone. And like my work is really about supporting Indigenous folks, Black youth, uh, like Brown youth, Asian youth, uh, and so it's. Yeah, this idea when I'm thinking about youth that I work with, it's not specifically South Asian. It's it's youth. I work and support youth of color and indigenous youth. Um, and I guess like a, a story would be that like I, I I'm, I'm reading all these applications right now. Everyone just finished applying to become youthline volunteers. And there's this question on the form that says like leave us you know leave us a number and then like. Uh, can we leave you a message at this number? If so, can it be a detailed message or should it be like secret? Like, should it just be like, call me back? Um, because not everyone can receive messages at home. And uh, I'm always really quick to read the applicants who are people of color and indigenous people because like, I'm genuinely just really excited that they actually want to work at Ufly. I'm like, that's a thing that you want to be a part of this and that's great. But in looking at their forms, there totally are people who are like, no, I can't, uh, please call me at this number, don't leave a message or whatever. But equally, if not more that I've seen recently, are people who are like, yeah, that's my mom, she's my emergency contact, like <laughs> leave her a message, we're cool, she loves me, I'm out. Um, and a lot of them are from South Asian youth and like exactly what we're talking about, we have to like remember what you're saying is like, we're not just this homophobic culture and society, but they're, you know, we're individuals who deal with that every day, right? So there's, anyways, there's lots of people who are like, yay, that's great, so. Cool, um, okay, so for me, I guess it would be, um, so we operate three support spaces at ASAP, right? And I kind of involved with all three in some capacity, and so one of them um, was, it's called, it's called Snaden, um, and so it's a, a support group for Tamil guys who like uh, is Tamil MSM, um, and uh, it recently went through some changes and we had a relaunch earlier in the spring. Uh, but before that we had um, a volunteer come on that was I think 19 or 20. Um, and he was dealing with his own stuff, you know, stuff I've been through, stuff a lot of people have gone through. Um, but I was just really, like, I was just taken aback by the fact that, you know, he lives all the way in, in a burb one of the burbs, um, and was able to like find access to this space, right? And when he came to that space, um, he came with a lot of um, a lot of things that he was going through, a lot of things that he internalized over the years, um, shadism, racism, um, the fact that he was Tamil, the one, or like that, that word is just like torn up through the media in like the worst way possible that you don't want to identify with it sometimes. Um, and uh, it's a constant struggle and he was also dealing with his sexuality, right? And he didn't have any support, so I didn't know anyone. And I was just like, whoa, like I could relate to a lot of what you're bringing to the table, right? Um, but at the same time, he accessed that space, and I was I was terrified that you know he was going to come in, go, um, and then I might not see him again, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like one of the biggest fears when you're operating these spaces, especially when you have drop-in spaces or when you meet someone on outreach. You're like, okay, are they? You can see a space for them. You can see that you know there's support that can be accessed. There's some resources they can use. But will they come back? Um, Though this guy you know doesn't have a car, has to commute for two hours to get down here. Um, comes to our events, comes to not only that support group, comes to all three support spaces, because we have another one that's specifically for MSM youth uh, that are South Asian, um, and we have another one that's South Asian in general, Dosti, and then we have this Tamil space. It accesses all three spaces, and not only accesses it like in that shy sense of, I don't know if I belong here at first, but access it with like a passion that, yes, this is a space for me, and I belong here, and it's okay. And you know he's like five or six years younger than me, and I'm hating him for it. The fact that he's able to like have this kind of presence, right. and I didn't have that at that age. <laughs> I'm just like, where were you? Like, why was I not like this? Um, and he's volunteering, and he's just like all over his social media about everything we do, um, marching with us in the parade, and like so I'm like, awesome. whoa, it's so much awesome. And it's the best one is when you're like you're jealous. You're like, crap. Yeah. Like, yeah. why can I have been like that? Hopefully why you can, can I? Look at that and then be inspired by it, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's my own. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, so that's my that's my one minute. Yeah. And I'm just going to end very briefly. I actually think that um, in the five six years I've been here in Canada, um, there haven't really been there hasn't even really been anything like this. And I actually think that you know everybody else on this panel is an activist. And I think the fact that they exist and they're doing what they're doing and that this exists in a fairly 
you know, publicly funded way, mm -hmm. um, you know, is a good sign. I think it's a fairly, you know, I think Toronto has an, the advantage of having a real critical mass of South Asian cultures and queer cultures. And I think that that's a really, you know, I'm not sure that this kind of thing could happen in many other places. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's a real advantage that we should absolutely use. Um, so, you know, I think things are gradually getting better. And, you know, you're too young to be bitter about <laughs> 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 too young and beautiful. When I was coming out, <laughs> if I saw another Asian person in the bar, we'd both hide because we'd be like, oh yeah, my God, yeah, is that our cousin? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's my experience. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're contemporary. You're going to know each yeah. other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you so much to all of you for being here. Thank <laughs> you.